and we have an electric panel on cinematics beyond 360 and I want to very quickly introduce everybody so Richard Marks the head of Sony PlayStation Magic Lab uh, he joined Sony uh, in 1999 and I'm not allowed to say no okay he, he built he built back then something amazing uh, um, just imagine a depth camera that can track in real time a skeleton in your home and somehow uh, another company released it 10 years later uh, but uh, what happened is he's, he's the inventor and uh, lead of iToy if you remember that thing a very influential early vision based gaming console by Sony then the famous PS Move Vision SDK and an uh, unknown fun fact he actually has a PhD in underwater robotics very useful from Stanford so that's uh, Richard I, I, I'm gonna go through everybody and then everybody gives like a few minutes of like um, an introduction where they are right now and then we're gonna talk about where we want to go and what other fun topics there are then I'm very happy to have attracted Link Gaskin to come here from New Zealand and from Los Angeles he's the CEO he's sitting all the way out there um, he's the CEO of a, a very interesting startup 8i um, that has a new technology that you're going to hear about today that's um, very disruptive technology a paradigm that changes a lot how we think about VR and AR and he's Australian and New Zealand New Zealand Syrian entrepreneur right now he's in LA because of all the Hollywood business down there and uh, he raised for 8i over 15 million dollars of funding um, and um, I sort of put him on the spot because he's the only startup in this panel the other very small companies are Disney Sony and Microsoft so let's see how he, how 8i is gonna hold up against um, the other small companies um, then right next to him is Steve Sullivan my um, he's the partner development lead for Microsoft HoloLens no holographic video and he's going to talk more about what that means and he was for over 10 years the senior technology officer at Lucasfilm ILM where he was running a very large R&D lab uh, lots of pioneering computer vision research came out of that that sort of made it into the visual effects um, I happened to be in his lab for a while he was my boss um, he got three scientific and technology Academy Awards three technical Oscars and before that he was at rhythm and use and then last but not least John Gaeta he's currently the executive producer and this is John Gaeta if you in case you don't know um, <laughs> Uh, he was the executive uh, creative uh, he is the executive creative director at ILM X lab a new unit new media division uh, of Lucasfilm Disney he has been the visual effects supervisor on many influential films that push the boundaries like that little movie called the matrix and the matrix sequels speed racer what may what dreams may come and he got the Oscar for visual effects for the matrix uh, you might remember bullet time and many other breakthrough uh, moments in film history and I just also had to say he was at NYU because I also was at NYU for 10 years so um, yes that's our panel let's uh, welcome them um, and uh, I was trying to say some philosophical remarks at the beginning but in the interest of time I just skip over that cinematics has lots of definitions uh, but let's just say here we say it's photoreal storytelling uh, and uh, we sort of experience that a lot of filmmakers right now due to easy access to 360 but we want to go beyond 360 and we have several people here who work on platforms and on experiences on the panel and on four different or many many different things uh, and I skip over all this 
Uh, and we also, you might wonder what the ultimate platform is. We're going to talk about that too. And luckily, we have one person who was involved in one of the ultimate platforms here already. And let's just, without further ado, make a round through all four. Everybody has a few minutes. And we start with Richard Marks from Sony. <clears throat> all right. Thanks, Chris. So I run a group called Magic Lab, and sorry about the fonts, got a little shifted here, but <laughs> it's, uh, this is the lab where we work here. It's in San Mateo, as you can tell. Um, so what we do really there is look at new technologies through the lens of PlayStation and figure out how they would impact our business and what kinds of experiences we could use those new technologies to enable. And then we show those prototypes that we create of the experiences to the product groups. So the thing we've been working on most recently is PlayStation VR. Uh, I don't know, uh, hopefully you guys have heard of it, but I know some people haven't in the academic side. And it's, um, it's uh, probably the most interesting thing is it's 120 frames per second display. So it's a high, very high refresh rate. And uh, when we started it from the very beginning, we believe very strongly in having position tracking so that we could have a full six degree of freedom kind of parallax experience, and so we'll probably talk about that more. What we do mostly, of course, at PlayStation is create these kind of fantasy virtual worlds. So a lot of our experiences focus on things that are not real. But I'm not going to talk about so much of that today. Um, some of the experiences we make also are very realistic. And so this is one called The Deep, where you're being lowered into a, a shark cage, in a shark cage, and it's very pretty for a while, and then it gets intense. And so, and it's it, it's got a very much of a feeling of like a, a classical Disney ride, where you know your your starts off, and then it gets more and more intense as it goes. And actually, we have this experience in the demo session later, so you can come over and try this experience out on a, on the PlayStation VR headset with PlayStation. So, um, another thing that my group worked on, we did the very initial prototype of an experience for The Walk. The Walk was a movie created by Sony Pictures, and then there was a VR experience that let you have that feeling of when you're standing on the edge of the World Trade Center and you want to step out onto the wire to give you some kind of empathy for how difficult that is. And you know, it's just anecdotal, but only about half of the people are able to take a single physical step forward. And I mean, they just put the headset on 30 seconds ago in some room, and then they still can't bring themselves to take one step forward. So. Here's a little video kind of showing you that. I think there's audio to this. Maybe? I don't know. Try to look down because that's the fun part. All right. Yeah. That the video's not key anyway, but no, it's working out. <laughs> I hope it's working out. Oh, wow. So there's a little strip of rubber on the ground that gives you that simulation when you reach your foot out. And this is a classical yeah, cool. VR thing people have done in the past. You made it all the way? Really scared. I didn't yeah. make it. No, I didn't make it. You made it all the way to the end. No, I didn't. Yeah. But so the interesting thing is they took a lot of footage that, you know, all the assets from the movie that were trying to be as photorealistic as possible to create a movie and brought that into a, a game engine in order to render it for VR and give it a six degree of freedom tracking. My team just did a prototype of that. The final experience was created by a, a effects house. Another thing that my group worked on is working with NASA on something called, we called it Morpheus because we used to call our product Morpheus. And so the, the real experience was just to feel like you're standing on Mars. And so they took real, uh, real photos from the Mars rover and stitched them together into a 3D kind of scene. And then you could just look around and then at, at some point the, the Mars rover comes up and gets very close to you and, and rolls over and so you can explore the Mars rover. And so that is also very, very realistic and it's again using kind of game engine technology but real world data mixed together. And then I'm going to skip over this. This is, uh, maybe this will come up later. But I'll introduce Link. Thanks. Right. Link. Um. And do you have your clicker, yeah, or I should do. I do? Yeah, it's okay. all good. It should work, hopefully. <clears throat> cool. OK, hi, everyone. So uh, ADI started um, 
a few years ago, and, and, and uh, the reason it started was because I had an aha moment. And I'm sure many of you have already had your VR aha moments. And for me, it was actually uh, putting on one of the first Kickstarter editions of Oculus Rift and actually seeing absolutely nothing. And that was the moment where I, I, I sort of went to, well, what would, what would this look like? What would content on, in VR look like? And I, I wanted to actually uh, go to far off places, but I wanted to go with people. And at the time, that was just really impossible. So uh, I tracked down uh, my co-founder uh, in New Zealand, and it was uh, Eugene Dion. And Eugene uh, had come from NVIDIA where he had invented the way that humans were rendered for computer games uh, before uh, working for Peter Jackson at Weta Digital where he had been working on Rise of Planet of the Apes and Gollum. And uh, what, we had, what we had basically done is tried to solve this problem of how to get the most realistic humans into volumetric VR. And if you look at uh, where this is going, now we're in the situation where we're all going from the flat screen to the holodeck. So what does that look like? What does it look like in the future? And that, that's basically where instead of, instead of browsing a website, you're walking into a website. It's where you're going on a test drive with Elon Musk. It's, it's where you're going on your first virtual online date. It's where, uh, where grandparents are seeing in AR their, first, their child's first, uh, their grandkids' first steps uh, walking towards you in, in, in AR. And, uh, the, and the thing that sort of drives all of this uh, is humans. And if you think about YouTube, uh, most of YouTube content, if you look at what's actually involved, is humans. And we think that this is the killer app uh, for VR and AR. And the problem, though, is that humans are really hard to create in 3D. And this is something, what you're looking at here is a piece by journalist uh, Nani de la Pena, who's a pioneer in, in the space. And she's had to use up until now these CG uh, uh, scenes, which really create this uncanny valley feeling. It's manual, slow, and expensive. Uh, and she's also tried 360 video, which is, the problem is it's still a flat screen at the end of the day, and there's no interaction. And so, uh, so this is, a, this is a real problem for her, and the other thing is that it's not just Nani, it's actually everybody, because the moment that you, you actually have realistic humans, that's the moment where it goes from computer gaming into being a mainstream medium. And so that medium needs to look, look photorealistic, needs to be inexpensive, and it needs to be streamable. And this is, this is really where we're coming from. We've, we've created this piece of software that sits in the cloud, and we, uh, we essentially take off-the-shelf standard video cameras and convert them automatically with no rigging, no post-production, no cleanup uh, into volumetric humans, which you can then place into Unity and, uh, and Unreal gaming engines. And we're doing this with the vision that this is something that everybody's going to do for the future, and this is the way that you're going to be preferring to record memories and tell new types of stories uh, in the future so that everybody is going to be able to, with a smartphone uh, or in a, in a large studio, uh, capture and then play back this type of tech. And so this is an example of where we are today. This is a 70 megapixel uh, holographic human. Uh, and what you should be noticing there is that we've actually got to the point where you can actually start to see individual strands on, your, on the beard, and you can actually finally start to see uh, reflections in, in people's eyes. So this is a, sort of where we are, but obviously we're continuing to take it to the most realistic place possible. Great. Thank you. All right, and now let's switch to John Gaeta, back to Keynote. Um, You so I'll just say if you just okay. Uh, hello, uh, I don't really have a PowerPoint, um, but I thought I'd just uh, kick off with a basic statement. Um, so, uh, like all sort of uh, mediums, you can trace back the beginning of these uh, to a very few group of small group of people that uh, are having similar thoughts at the same time and uh, and over time you see those people starting to branch out and become influencers and builders and then before you have before you know it you have platforms um, one thing I uh, am um, 
sort of very uh, blessed to have had happen was to sort of cross the path of people who were thinking uh, on various topics um, a ways back that um, intellectually stimulated my thoughts in these areas and then allowed me to have a path where I met all sorts of people who were creating building blocks. So uh, quite a few years back, I spent five years with the Wachowskis who were um, very, very seriously trying to understand the sublime nature of complete and total flawless immersion. And so, oh, we're showing something. Um, I didn't know that. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so <laughs> let's draw a line from there to now. Um, no, I met a lot of people. Um, a lot of people came out of the woodwork um, in that time. At the time, uh, the thing that I found was most interesting about that first experience was that uh, the Wachowskis basically get, enabled us to sort of explore the imagery that sort of reflected that state in any way we chose and they really didn't stand in our way so we basically uh, created a bunch of fantastic associations with people, uh, some in the audience, um, who were embarking on the, the building blocks of true virtual reality and so we were able to make cinematic images and the, uh, the concept uh, in a way was hacked for cinema. Um, and we can talk more about it later but from then to now I still have these associations and I see them really starting to build the, the roots of this. No, I, I actually show more videos more. if you want to talk more okay. about videos. Uh, that last one was a, okay, so well, anyway, t recently, um, last two years, uh, I was lucky enough to be asked uh, by folks at Lucasfilm to come in and uh, disrupt a bit and um, so uh, we've been sort of harnessing uh, many, many years of pre-thought going into ways of creating illusion in cinema and sort of began to redirect that into uh, reactive experiences and mixed reality type of experiences and that's just from a format point of view. The other thing that I would say is that what is very different about Lucasfilm is that in one place you have some of the most advanced uh, work going on in accelerated graphics alongside uh, some of the most competent story development people that exist and you have them literally occupying similar floors and so we are trying a rather fun experiment where we are combining these things and with the uh, advantage of having a universe, Star Wars, we can start to try to explore what is a relevant experience for a person to have inside of a fictitious universe and we are able to do that at very high fidelity uh, so we have things like this thing right here you're looking at is a essentially a holodeck an immersive cave but the immersive cave can uh, deliver near film fidelity scenes that ILM makes for movies so we can actually step into holographic uh, versions of the things that you're seeing in the movies that they're putting out right now, not, not even at visualization level, but higher. And, um, but more fun than that, I mean, that's the world of uh, passive. So we are now doing quite a lot of live driving of things and proceduralized uh, experiences as well. I think I'll stop there. Great, thank you. Um, so now in this panel we're trying something new. We want to have more audience interaction. And so um, I will ask the first question to the panel. I actually asked the first question to the panel already. What you're working on right now? And we got a pretty elaborate answer. Um, but then every question I ask, then we make a turn and you ask a question and then we go from there. And I'm not sure how it is with the microphones, but I will repeat before you shoot out, I will repeat for the, for the camera whatever you asked. And so um, now we know what you're doing. Um, and I saw at Sundance your installation, John Gaeta, and there were lots of filmmakers and they were just scratching their head. How can they use it? Um, and uh, because you use it with creators inside ILM, uh, you use uh, HoloLens. Um, 
hopefully soon consumers are using it. Uh, Link is releasing pretty soon new apps, and Sony will come out in uh, fall. Oct October. Is that right? October. Yeah. And so, um, like, my first question is, like, this is very advanced stuff. How do you think you make it accessible to everybody? Any volunteer? <clears throat> Link. So as the startup here, our, our goal is really about scale and about growing this uh, to everybody and really, uh, really democratizing this space that traditionally has been a visual effect uh, field. And so what we're focused on is really working on uh, how to do that. So the first, the first thing we're going to do is release third-party studio instructions, essentially, uh, for people to be able to set up their own studios for the high end. But we're also working on the low end with iPhones, for example. And with a small array of iPhones, uh, we're already getting results of creating holograms with those. So it's really, uh, it's really uh, around the corner uh, for this sort of uh, this sort of uh, possibility, but it really comes down to uh, an interaction between uh, software like ours and the hardware manufacturers uh, to create the best tools to make that happen. Steve? Yeah, I think you know we're in a similar space. Um, <clears throat> I think our path is going to be viewing it as we have these humans, human performances, animal performances, and commoditizing them in a way that they can plug into a wide range of experiences. So our production platform is pretty mature now. We have experience using them uh, in applications on HoloLens. You can imagine putting them into Unity or, or Unreal or just handing them off as assets to a visual effects facility, and they incorporate them into their wide range of experiences. So we know there's a big vacuum in, in VR, MR, AR for humans at all, but we also think there's a, a lot of interest in uh, seeing uh, multi, you know, like extraordinary uh, performances or instructional situations or personal memories uh, in this richer format even on traditional desktop environments. So we're going to view it as kind of getting assets in there to a wide range of experiences. So what you, you having a studio, like also the three of you are running very high-end studios. Are you inviting creators, like maybe now John since you're the next, um, are you inviting people inside the Star Wars universe, or? <laughs> um, well, I mean, actually, as much as could be done. I mean, with the with the films, they're, what's interesting and what they're doing is they're letting each and every film be done by a different director, mm -hmm. which is a kind of goes against the the trend of Hollywood. But um, at this time, we're not necessarily sort of turning ourselves into a service bureau at all. We're like interested in making original IP. And so we're trying to understand what that should be. We want to understand what our form, you know, our signature could be. And of course that'll evolve, but uh, it's, it's still a little internal. Yeah, well, I'm Sony is a kind of unique company because we're a platform company, but also a content company. So we do both but we can't make all the content that we would want to make for our platform. So we have a, you know, a lot of third parties that create the best content that we have. So, so maybe you should talk. Well, we do, <laughs> yeah. So this, this is one. Oh, yeah. this is one. <laughs> What's your company? Do you have a car? Uh, well, okay, so um, I don't know. So now let's turn over to the audience. What question do you have? Um, who's first, who's first? Very shy audience. Uh, no, you're not shy. Um, well, while you're thinking, okay, here. What place does audio take? Audio, great question. What place does audio place? Um, who wants to take that first? Mm. Uh, I'll take a step. Um, it's got an absolute pivotal role. It's probably, I don't, people say that uh, there's only a half of, a film or ha if you have no sound. I mean, sound really provides this sort of texture in so many ways and, and uh, it's, it's absolutely true for exper experiences as well is that so much more can be suge suggested beyond that which you perceive with sound. And so we're finding that it is really quite a linchpin in terms of sort of like filling in uh, all manner of, of sort of de details. In the context of human capture, we tend to capture and try to position the audio with the actor. And we don't really want to capture 
the capture space audio, the ambient audio at the time, we want it localized, but then in the experience it's vital that if the character looks at you or looks away from you, you detect that audio position and direction information. Otherwise it sounds like their voice is decoupled from, from them and it gets really disturbing. Yeah, historically games you know, have often been played with people turn the sound off, which is people who make the games cringe at that. And it's great with VR that since there is a, a headpiece now, it's just very natural that you would always keep the audio intact with the video because you're wearing something anyway. So I think, and, and if you don't have that piece, then it is just not nearly as much presence that you get. So it's not as much of a concern anymore that the audio will get turned off because it adds so much to a VR experience. I don't, I don't think that there's any doubt that the spatialized audio is a huge factor. And especially also if you do social things and you're talking to somebody else who's in VR with you, if the audio is not coming from the right place and stuff, it, it doesn't feel right. Yeah, it's part of you know, your sense of orientation and really believing where you are is to have sound come. I really like that that was the first question because that <laughs> mm -hmm. often takes a little bit, right, for us to get past graphics and back mm -hmm. past all these things, but we really are finding that that is such a significant part of the, uh, the belief of what, what's going on. That's also, the fidelity of audio now is really good, and the fidelity of the graphics are not as good as the audio fidelity that's already. Right, that's right. And so yeah, everyone asks, what's the field of view of the headset? Well, the audio field of view is, is every, all the way around, so already the audio can be awesome. Mm -hmm. So audio, like, yeah, audio has also uh, become a really important tool for telling stories because now that you don't cut the same way as, as previous, in previous mediums, you have to find other ways to direct a user or a viewer's attention. And so positional audio becomes really important in doing that. So you hear the car coming uh, from a certain direction to get somebody to move. We have another audience question, question. from Joyce. Yeah. Um, so you heard Niels give a talk today, right, on the 3D sound and the whole sound field. I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about how much that has had an impact. Is that research really far out there, or are you using some of those ideas? Well, we, we have HRTF audio built into the SDK that you use when you use our headset. And actually, the, the headset comes with a piece of hardware, it's a little box, and that does 3D spatialized audio in hardware. So that's the only real dedicated hardware we have, is the audio in some ways. Uh, so, Skywalker Shound is involved in that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a new game coming out, VR game, with the original sound, lightsaber sounds I've seen at Game Developers Conference. Is that right? I think, well, I think one um, of the trickiest things, though, of that is blending in artificial audio with real audio. So audio that's been captured in a real scene and then adding things to that, that that's, a, that's a tricky problem, I think. So two questions. Mark, then... Yeah, Mark, please. This is a question uh, mainly for Steve Sullivan. Can you say a little bit more about the technology behind the volumetric video-based representations? What is the actual, what's the capture technology and what's the representation technology? Sure. Um, we uh, have a, a, a ring of cameras. It's a very controlled studio environment at the moment. We just recently got rid of the need for green screens, so that will help a lot. Um, we use RGB cameras and IR cameras, but no active depth sensing, so it's all optical but we do try to help the stereo algorithms as much as we can, and we also rely on silhouette cutouts to get very high definition detail, get fingers, things like that. And then we process it on a farm, and it uh, comes out a very high res thing, and then depending on your application, whether you want to keep the high res or whether you want to crank it down to, to lower fidelity for streaming, we'll do things like preserve faces and, and fingers so you get the detail you care about even in the lower resolution volume. The final representation is video and depth map and an alpha mask for each camera, or do you have a volumetric representation? It's actually a, a, a surface mesh with a video texture on it. So think of it as textured OBJs per frame is what we could, could spew out if people want to get in and work on it. So gentlemen over there, we're like just taking audience This is a good now. way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Uh, I've seen the uh, hollow teleportation demo, and it was really fantastic. I'm wondering if uh, anybody on the panel could speak around uh, applications, uh, social applications for uh, volumetric capture, and if you've done any research or experiments with that. Social. Uh, do you want? I mean, to me, the ultimate is the live version of that. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's the next, you know, it's the next thing after television, in my in my view. Um, the uh, there's a lot of discussion about what it really ought to be applied to first, but to me, communications and sort of just understanding what real people are doing, um, memory capture, you know, I think that that whole area, I think, you know, for the same reason why, you know, the invention of the snapshot basically was one of the most significant things in, in, in the society because people could sort of remember their lives, I think that it's going to become one of the largest of all things. So there's, there's no denying that, you know, the social platforms are what they are, you know, the scale of what they are for a particular reason. And I think that that will, that sort of thing will fit in there. The question is how it becomes something that's in your home or in your hand. I do agree with the, the idea that the device, the mobile device is going to continue to evolve significantly in that way. Um, but yeah, that, that's... Steve, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ben. I was going to say, as Steve and I were talking earlier of, of saying, we were just commenting that you know, what's the biggest demand that we're having uh, in our studios, and, and that is uh, people wanting to record their kids. And, and there's something really, uh, you know, kids, everyone that has, uh, has kids knows how fast they grow up. And there's just something about capturing those moments, those memories, uh, over, that, over time. And then the interesting thing is, we actually, the first one we ever did uh, was this baby uh, uh, called Reese. And Ashley, her mom, um, had recorded her as a four month old, kind of holding her in her arms. And six months later, we brought her back. Uh, into the studio and she actually stepped into her hologram and put her arms up again and then relived this moment in front of us of seeing her baby again as a four month old and she just couldn't like she's her mind was blown because she didn't remember like this the way that um, she sounded the way they like the size of her legs and just these things that she just didn't want to leave and it really says to me that this is going to be truly the the place where VR and AR are going yeah, I think it's the largest of all the applications, but there is like obviously for many years we've been trying, we've been driving towards trying to do volumetric capture of, of people for artistic applications like cinema and such and that turned out to be not necessarily the right medium for it because really you could, except for in cases of where you needed people to do extraordinary things, you could more or less use real people, <laughs> right? Um, but only as, a, as mixed reality and VR has sort of come online has it become obvious that you want, you want to put, do that art in that performance, that storytelling in, in a volumetric sense though, so that people can be within intimate proximity of that. The only challenge at the moment, which these guys know uh, quite a bit about, is that it's a very difficult thing to relight. <laughs> and um, it's part of that sort of like flawless integration that's important for belief, to believe that. But um, it's like anything else, is that that will, will get past that at some point. And same with the very uh, elaborate systems, right, that we have to use today. It will be at some point, I don't know how many years, but a method of doing this in the real world um, and so, yeah, there'll, there will be uh, quite a grand uh, art form of, for performance as well with those kinds of methods. Speaking to the real time, we have quite a few discussions with the, uh, the research team doing the holoportation demo. And um, there's a lot in common, but a lot that's different too. When we map out our scenarios, there's certain things where you want high definition, archival, broadcastable stuff. And the real time, it really is, right now anyway, all about communication. And of course, you want to be able to archive that too, but it's about that immediacy and the credibility that I'm talking to this other person who's reacting to me. Uh, so they're actually quite nice compliments, and it's the same with the underlying technologies. Some things we'll share, and some things we actually won't for a while. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see how the two spaces evolve. Okay, I get the signal. We're way over time, but I squeeze in one more question. And actually, he was waiting longer. The, the gentleman with the mic, I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, he has the mic already. Okay. 
Um, so last in, one. <laughs> so, in the last panel, uh, we heard a very nice story about a little girl's uh, encounter with a virtual ballet dancer who fell down. So I wanted to ask the panelists, what has been your most powerful emotional experience with these platforms or the most powerful emotional experience you've witnessed? Great question. Um, we uh, shot um, Buzz Aldrin, did a capture of Buzz Aldrin to narrate a Mars Explorer experience for HoloLens. And so he comes out and he introduces Mars, talks a bit about his past, but really about the future. And when people go through that experience, we showed it at the Build Conference recently done in, in you know, San Francisco, and people were really moved because they understood, A, that's really Buzz Aldrin there, you know, that's how it impressed you, but B, you know, it's, it, it's him talking about the future, a future he, uh, he wants to have and has been working towards for years. And uh, it's, it was just a, an incredible moment that you only get with the immediacy and credibility of a photographic solution. Link. Um, other than the one that I talked about of the, the mom and her child, uh, which is very emotional um, being, in, uh, being there with her as she's leaving this message to her, her child, in, you know, that um, maybe after she's already gone and this is the last message she has, I'm also excited about what Nani Della Pena is doing with us next, uh, which is taking you to this main high security prison where she's recording it with uh, uh, essentially a photogrammetry for the environment and then putting these uh, ex-convicts in there with you. And it's just like those really immersive moments, I think, is really where this type of volumetric VR is really taking people at the, to places they've never been and really intensifying the emotions that you can't get out of any other medium. Um, I'm, I, um, I apologize, but I, don't, um, I can't really t accurately talk about that particular one, but um, I'm not sure I've, I've seen something that is like where I want to use that word yet, powerful word, like superpower, not, not quite yet. So, so, so for me, uh, kind of similar, like, there hasn't been necessarily a direct like, emotional experience I've had that I don't feel like I could have had on a 2D screen. There's a different kind of experience, which is the immediacy when something's nearby you is a very strong thing that VR gives you that doesn't, there's no other way to get. So you know, you, a remote screen here can tell an amazing story that makes you cry, but having somebody like, just sit down next to you in VR is a much more powerful reaction than I have ever gotten from a screen. I mean, I've never been so scared as I have been when something's nearby me in VR, if that's what they're trying to evoke. So that part of it is, I think, the biggest effect that it's had on me. All right, we're out of time. These were good closing remarks. Uh, it looks like we almost skipped the uncanny valley are on a canny hill right now, especially, especially when you listen to what the last experiences were. Um, so thanks to the audience. I'm from Google and this was the Google way of honoring a panel. We let just the crowd run it instead of curate it. Um, thanks to the panelists. Um, thank you everybody. So. Thank you.